Hello and welcome to my video all about how to get started working with polymer clay. I'm going to be talking about all the stages from choosing and buying your clay all the way up to and including the baking stage. It's a fairly long video but please stick with it there'll be lots of tips and advice given along the way. This video is aimed at beginners, however I'm going to be very comprehensive so maybe people with more experience will also pick up some tips. The first thing I'm going to talk about is what you're going to need in terms of tools and materials before you can get started. Here you can see a setup which is the minimum number of items you need to get started with making polymer clay items. Obviously the first thing is the clay. Here is some Fimo Soft that I'm going to be using, which is a good choice for beginners, but I'll cover more about the brands of clay a bit later on in the video. You'll also need a work surface and a surface to bake your clay on. These might be the same surface or different. I personally work on ceramic tile and bake on ceramic tile because this just makes it easier. I don't have to transfer the clay to a different surface to bake it. In terms of work surface, you need something that is smooth and flat and also something that the clay won't stick to. The most popular choices are glass and ceramic tile. I personally favour ceramic tile but some people favour a flat piece of glass instead. You can use the glass from a cheap photo frame if you wish. As long as it's smooth and flat you can use it. As a kind of DIY work surface you can take a piece of stiff card and cover it with parchment or baking paper. You can also buy non-stick mats designed for using with clay. I think Sculpey do one. And there are also acrylic sheets available. In terms of the services you can bake your clay on, again a ceramic tile is perfect. You can also use a metal roasting tin and I'll be talking a bit more later about what other materials you can use. You'll also need a cutting blade. I have a pretty short blade here, but the important thing is it's thin. They're called tissue blades, and that's what people use to cut clay very easily, like butter. Fimo and a couple of other brands have brought out their own set of blades. They're usually rigid flexible or serrated blades. I would definitely recommend getting at least a long rigid and long flexible blade. However just a short blade like this one here is enough to get you started. There are other cutting implements that you can add to your collection as you go along including a exacto knife for instance for cutting out more intricate shapes from your clay However, you have to remember to protect your work surface from scratches when you use a knife like that. You can also use cookie cutters, which are great because they come in a whole range of shapes and they allow you to cut a specific shape out of clay really quickly and easily. A little tip for using cookie cutters is if you put a piece of cling film or sarin wrap on top of your clay, make sure it's nice and smooth then put the cookie cutter on top of the cling film and push down into the clay. The cling film will create a kind of domed effect and a curved edge around where you've cut the clay. Otherwise, without the cling film, you just get a straight edge. So there's a nice little tip for you. Then there are tools to put holes into your polymer clay and these range from just needles and pins to toothpicks and straws. You can also buy piercing pins which are specifically designed to put holes in the polymer clay or you can wait until you've baked the clay and then use a small micro drill to add the holes you want. If you get into polymer clay as a hobby you'll see that there are so many tools and materials and gadgets you can buy for this hobby and some of them do look really really cool and you can get some brilliant effects. However, you can also get brilliant effects without all the extra fancy items and fancy gadgets. So don't feel the need to buy a lot to start with. This is all you need. The final thing is an acrylic roller. Now these are pretty inexpensive and 
easily available and I would definitely recommend that you get one of these. If you don't want to buy a roller yet then you can use a smooth glass jar to do the rolling of the clay instead. As long as you use something that is smooth and round and the clay won't stick to then it'll work. Some people invest in a pasta machine just to use for their clay and I would definitely recommend doing this if you turn polymer clay into a hobby of yours because it does make conditioning the clay a lot quicker and easier. So that's basically everything you need to get started. I'm now going to do a demonstration of how to condition clay. Now conditioning clay is the process of turning the clay straight out of the packet from a hard, sometimes crumbly clay into a nice, soft, pliable clay that's easy to work with. It's an absolutely vital step and it's really easy to do. It doesn't take very long. However, some clays are harder than others. So the harder the clay, obviously, the more time and effort you're going to have to put into conditioning it. If you use polymer clay a lot, then conditioning clay can be hard on your hands. And I would definitely suggest getting a pasta machine to make it easier for yourself. There are also some other ways of making it easier for yourself and easier for your hands. What I'm doing first is just cutting the amount of clay I want off the clay block. I'm then going to dive straight into conditioning it. As you can see, it's crumbly and there are lots of cracks in the clay. What I'm gonna do is just try and heat it up with my hand by just squeezing the clay together into a ball shape. Now, this is very hard on your hands when you're just squeezing what is a hard material. So to make it easier on yourself, you wouldn't do this. You would just cut the clay you want off the block. Then you will put that clay into a sealed Ziploc bag. Then there are a few ways of warming up the clay. In colder conditions, if your house is cold, it's winter, then the clay is going to be even firmer and this is even more of a good idea. You can either put this Ziploc bag full of clay in some warm water, very warm water but not hot, for about 15 minutes. Or you could sit on it, or some people even put it in their bra, just to warm it up. And you want to do that for about 15-20 minutes while you're doing something else. And that will make the clay a lot warmer and a lot easier on your hands. Another way of doing it is taking that Ziploc bag of clay putting it on a protected surface and then using a mallet or rolling pin just to basically hit the clay. You wouldn't do this step if you were just using a small amount of clay. However, if you were planning to use most of or all of a block of clay, then this is a really good way of just doing the first stages of conditioning. You hit it all over, trying to just reshape it as much as you can because the more you squash it, the more it's going to be conditioned. This is probably not a good idea though, if you have neighbors who can hear you. So once you've done one of those steps, just to give it the initial warming up, you take the clay out of the bag and it should be a bit easier to work with. You then do what I'm doing here and just try and squeeze that clay into a ball shape, just to try and bring all of the clay together. Don't roll it out too thin. You don't want it any thinner than I've rolled it out here. Fold it in half and roll again. Then fold it in half and roll again and keep repeating that. Or you can take it over to the pasta machine. You can see that when you roll out the clay the first time, there are cracks all the way around the edge. And when you fold it, it will crack along that fold. This is what you don't want. Conditioned clay will not crack. So you just keep going and repeating these steps until the clay no longer cracks. You want it nice and supple and pliable. And here is the finished clay. You can see that there are no cracks all around the edge and it's nice and conditioned. If in doubt, condition it some more. You don't want to under condition it, you more likely want to over condition it, if anything. So just keep going until you know it's nice and pliable and easy to work with. 
and then you can get on with shaping it into whatever you like. In terms of using the past machine, what you would do is do the warming up stage, as I mentioned before, then maybe roll it out a little bit so that it's thin enough to go through the pasta machine. What you don't want to do is take a hard block of clay straight out of the packet and then try and force it through the pasta machine. You want to at least warm it up a little bit and roll it out slightly before you put it through the pasta machine because otherwise you'll put your machine through too much strain, you'll put the rollers under too much pressure and you risk damaging it. You'll probably be using the thicker setting on the pasta machine and you put the clay through. You then fold that clay in half and put the clay through again. Each time you put it through the machine, it should go into the machine folded edge first. This is very important because if you don't, then you risk trapping air inside the clay. This is also important when you are hand rolling your clay. Always make sure that you are not making an air pocket. You're not trapping air inside the clay. So whenever you fold clay, make sure that you roll either from the center outwards or from the folded edge across. Because what you don't want is to not give the air a way to escape from the clay. So just bear this in mind whenever you're rolling and folding your clay. So you just keep doing that over and over, folding the clay in half, putting it through the machine again, folded edge first, and you do this about 25 to 30 times in order to get properly conditioned clay. If you then want a thinner thickness of clay, you can work your way down the settings on the machine until you get the desired thickness. I definitely wouldn't recommend going from the thicker setting to the thinner straight away because the clay might end up wrinkling and falling apart. So definitely work your way gradually down the settings. Another important thing about pasta machines is keeping them clean. You might want to keep them covered when you're not using them so that dust doesn't get all over them. And you also want to give them a wipe with a wet wipe, preferably one containing alcohol, before each use. This is because clay from a previous project might still be stuck somewhere on the rollers and you also don't want dust that could be on your rollers to transfer to your clay. So that's it, then you've got your clay nice and conditioned and warmed up and it's ready to use. I'm just going to give you a little tip now about hand rolling your clay to a certain thickness. So if you don't have a pasta machine to create the correct thickness for you, then you just take your clay and put it in between lollipop sticks and you just rest your acrylic roller on top of those sticks and keep rolling and eventually your clay will become the same thickness as those sticks. If you want your clay to be a different thickness than the thickness of a lollipop stick then playing cards are a lot more accurate and give you more choice. You can put stacks of playing cards of equal height on either side of your clay and then just do exactly the same thing. Just roll your clay and eventually the roller will come to rest on the playing cards and make the clay that particular thickness. So that's just a little tip for getting an even thickness when you're hand rolling. If you find you're still getting problems with bubbles in your clay and you're being careful when folding the clay during conditioning and always rolling from the folded edge, then what you can do instead is not fold your clay, but instead tear it. So instead of folding the clay in half, you tear it in half and then layer those halves together before rolling. This gives the air four edges to escape from rather than just three, which might help you a little bit. Also, if you're making a flat clay item, you can bake that item between two tiles. So if you have two ceramic tiles, you can sandwich the clay in between the two smooth surfaces of the tiles and then bake it like that. The weight of the tile on top of the clay will hopefully stop the air bubbles rising to the surface of the clay. So that could be a good way of preventing air bubbles too, if you're finding that an issue. I'm now going to talk a little bit about the different brands of clay because each brand has different characteristics. So I'm going to tell you briefly the basic differences between all of the brands that I'm aware of. So all the more common brands. 
I'm going to start with Fimo because that's the one that I mainly have used. And I personally think Fimo Soft is a very good choice for beginners. Fimo was the first polymer clay brand created and it's the most common brand in Europe. There are two types, there's Fimo Soft and Fimo Professional, which used to be called Fimo Classic. Obviously, Fimo Soft is softer than the Professional version. The Professional version is a bit stronger than the soft one, but it's also harder to condition. So that's why I recommend Fimo Soft for beginners, because then it eases you into working with polymer clay. I don't want to recommend you a very firm clay to start with, because that might put you off. You can also get some Fimo Effects clay, which has some very interesting and fun effects to use, including things like glittery clay and stone effect clay. Fimo Professional is particularly good for making canes. And if you don't know what canes are, they're basically rods of clay that have the same shape and same pattern running through them all the way along. So if you then slice those rods, all the slices look the same. I'll be explaining more about canes in another video. These flowers that I'm showing here are an example and they would have been cut as slices off a cane. It's a very popular section of polymer clay art. So if that's what you're wanting to get into, then Fimo Professional is a very good choice. Fimo is pretty strong when baked and it holds its detail well. Then we move on to Sculpey Clay, which was the first clay that I ever heard of. And this is probably because it's used very often for general craft purposes. So if you're sort of a general crafter, you might have come across this one because it's often used in different craft tutorials across the internet. If you're not really getting into polymer clay as a hobby, but you maybe want to do a one-off project in clay, or maybe you've got kids who really want to have a go at playing with clay, then Sculpey is a really good choice because it's soft. That's the important thing about Sculpey. It's soft and there are lots of colours to choose from. On the flip side of that, it is comparatively weak and can break easily, especially thinner pieces. So it's all right if it's for general craft use. Maybe you're making more chunky items in clay, but for more intricate work, I wouldn't personally recommend Sculpey. And then we move on to Cernit, which I have used before, but I found it too soft for my purposes. The upsides to Cernit are that it's easy to condition because it's quite soft. And it's also pretty strong when baked, especially when you're baking thin pieces of clay. This is because it maintains its flexibility. So although the final results won't be as solid as other brands, because it's quite flexible, it means it's quite strong too and harder to break even when you're making thinner pieces. So it totally depends what kind of end result you want and what you're using the clay for. I wouldn't recommend Cernit for caning or anything where you want fine detail. However, it definitely has its uses and it's available in flesh tones as well as in interesting colours like neons. Another brand is Primo, which seems to be favoured by polymer clay artists and people who sell their work. It does seem to be seen as superior, especially for sculpting, because it does hold its shape well and also holds detail well. It's quite firm, but not too firm. And Primo also comes in flesh colours, so it's good for making dolls with, for instance. So, like Fimo, it's a very good all-rounder, and it does seem to be seen as the best brand by a lot of polymer clay artists. The last brand I'm going to talk about is Kato, which, as far as I'm aware, is the firmest clay out there. Now, some people don't like it because it's so firm and difficult to condition and get pliable. However, the upside is that once it's baked, it's very strong and it's also very good for caning. So if you can get through having to condition such a firm clay, then it might be worth it depending on what you're going to use the clay for. So in conclusion, what should beginners buy? Well, my recommendation would be to get a sample block of either Primo or Fimo Soft just to see if you get on with it. 
if you find it too firm and hard to condition, you don't like it, then try the other brand. So if you start with Primo, you don't like it, try Fimo Soft and vice versa. If you don't get on with either of those brands, then maybe try Cernit, which is a lot softer, but is quite strong still after baking. Once you find a brand that you're happy with, then I would suggest buying blocks of black, white, and then each primary color, so red, yellow, and blue. So that's five different blocks of your favorite brand, because from those five colors, you can make any color you like, except for the special colors and effects like neon or imitation stone or glittery clay, things like that. So that would be my recommendation for a beginner, but it's totally up to you. And of course, you don't have to even stick with one of the common brands. There are all sorts of brands out there. And it's up to you to just sample them and experiment with them and see which suits you the best. Different brands don't specifically recommend mixing the brands together, but you totally can. There's nothing to say that you can't mix Fimo with Primo or any other brands. So if there are different colours and effects you like, then feel free to mix between the brands. The thing to note is that if the brands you're using have different baking temperatures, then take an average of those temperatures. So for instance, if you mix two clays, one that has a baking temperature of 130 degrees centigrade and another that has 110 degrees centigrade, then maybe bake at 120 degrees centigrade. Same for baking time as well, you could take an average, however I would err on the side of caution and put the clay in for the longer time. So if there's a clay that has a baking time of 30 minutes and one that has a baking time of 20 minutes, I would say put it in for at least 25 minutes, probably more like 30 to be honest, just to be on the safe side. The longer a clay bakes for, the stronger it is, so I would err on the side of caution in terms of baking time. The next topic to discuss is how to store your clay. Now, I always used to think that clay dried out in air, but actually it's more like age that makes clay go dry. Particularly Fimo and Primo are affected by the age of the clay. So if you've had some Fimo or Primo or other clay in your cupboard for a few years, you might find that when you open it up, it's all a bit crumbly and dry. A lot of crumbly clay can be revived all you have to do is add a drop or two of liquid clay or clay softener. I'll be talking about liquid clay a little bit later on. And you just mix that into the crumbly clay and it should bring the clay all together and make it a lot easier to condition and work with. Sometimes it's not revivable. Sometimes it's just so old and so crumbly that it's probably best just to give up and buy some fresh clay especially if you're a beginner because you might lose the enjoyment of learning if you're trying to deal with crumbly clay to start with. You don't want to keep the clay out in the open, but that's not because it dries up, it's because dust and fluff gets onto it and that's what you really don't want. So I would definitely recommend keeping clay in sealed bags and separate them by colour so they don't contaminate each other. Keep them away from high heat so don't leave them somewhere maybe in a hot country near a window because the hotter it gets, the more risk you're running of baking the clay inside the container. And talking of dust and fluff, those are two things you definitely want to keep well away from any surface you're working on and your hands whilst you're working with clay. It's best to keep some wet wipes nearby, especially if they've got alcohol in, just to give everything a good wipe down before you start. And also to clean your tools before you start using them because they may still have tiny bits of clay left from a previous project or they might have some dust or other debris on them. It might seem over the top, but what you're wearing also does make a difference. If you're wearing fluffy, woolly clothes, anything that could molt that has fibres like maybe velvet, something like that, would be really bad to wear, especially if it's in a dark colour whilst you're working with clay. You don't want to be wearing something that will drop fibres everywhere and you also don't want to wear long sleeves that could touch your clay whilst you're working with it. 
It might seem like I'm being too cautious saying that, but to get the fibers and dust onto something you've been working hard on is just so frustrating. Another very important thing is to wash your hands thoroughly just before you use the clay. You don't want to wash them 10 minutes before, you want to wash them just before you handle the clay because you don't want to risk anything getting on your hands. You don't want to touch your clothes, especially clothes that molt fibres. And also, when you wash your hands, don't wipe them then on a fluffy, especially dark coloured towel. Try and wipe them dry on a paper towel instead. If you do notice any fibres on your clay surface whilst you're working with it, just stop and don't keep working with it, otherwise you'll embed that fibre further into the clay. Try and remove that fibre with your fingernail or with your blade. If it is dust and there's quite a lot of speckles on your clay surface, then what I would recommend is rubbing alcohol. You put some rubbing alcohol on some paper towel or cotton bud and you just rub it onto the surface of your clay. And that should hopefully get rid of most or all of the dust. Some people also recommend baby oil, but that is a little bit messier. It does pay to be cautious and to prevent that kind of messiness that you really don't want. You really want a clean look for your clay because it just looks so much nicer and more professional. As I said before, prevention is definitely better than cure. Another tip is to work from the lightest colour of clay first to the darkest colour. So if you have a project that has white, red and black clay involved, you would do as much work with the white clay as possible first, then move on to the red and then the black. That's because it has far more effect if you get black clay on white than it does if you get white clay on black. So that's just something to bear in mind. Sometimes when you're working with clay, you might find that it's too soft and maybe too sticky as well to work with. This could be down to a few different things, including the brand of clay you're using, the weather, or maybe you just have naturally hot hands. Either way, if it is too soft for you to do what you want to do with it, then either switch to a firmer brand, or if you're using a firmer brand already, then maybe put the clay in the fridge for about a quarter of an hour, just to firm it up a bit. And that'll help you, especially if you're making holes in your clay or shaping your clay in any way, having the clay firm will allow you to cut the clay cleanly. You could instead put the clay in the freezer for just a few minutes and it will have the same effect. This is particularly useful if you're making canes and you want to slice the clay very cleanly. Another way to stop the clay from being too soft or sticky is to do a process called leaching. Leaching is where you roll clay between two pieces of paper, which can be just normal printer paper. As long as it's absorbent paper, then it'll work. And then you put some kind of lightweight object on top, for instance, a lightweight book, just to press it down lightly. So you've got the paper, then the clay, then the paper, and then a book. You leave it for half an hour, and when you come back and remove the book and the paper, there should be oily patches on the paper, where the plasticizers have leached out of the clay and into the paper. This should make your clay a lot less sticky, and is a great way of stopping clay sticking to your acrylic roller in particular. If you have the opposite problem and the clay is too firm, then you can try the different processes of warming it up, as I detailed earlier in the conditioning the clay section. Or you could use a brand of clay that's softer. Other ways of doing it are to add a drop or two of liquid clay or something called clay softener, which is designed specifically for this purpose. I'm now going to demonstrate how to mix colours of clay together to give a solid colour or a marbled effect. So I have two balls of clay here in different colours and they've both been conditioned already. Now I'm just going to smush them together and basically just knead them like so until the colours combine. Now the fun thing is that for most of the time when you're mixing the colours will be separate and will form different patterns 
a bit like marbling. Now at any point in this mixing process you can stop and use the clay as it is. If you see a pattern emerge that you really love, that kind of marbled effect that we've got going here, you can just stop and then make something out of that. If you want a solid colour then just keep going and at some point the colours will just merge and will suddenly be a solid colour. And then you can use that for whatever purposes you want. So you can see there's that whole range of marbling that goes on when you mix two colours. And of course you can mix more than two colours, you can mix as many colours as you like. Experimentation is key with polymer clay. There are all sorts of things you can mix in such as glitter, sand, beads, metal chain or charms. You can put gold leaf on polymer clay. You can add shimmery eyeshadow powder and all sorts of craft powders, including powdered pigments and embossing powders, plus chalk pastels. There's all sorts of things you can mix in and stick on your polymer clay items. I implore you to experiment because that's how people come up with awesome new techniques and textures. And polymer clay is ripe for experimentation. So if you don't know if something's going to work, then just try it. You can always fail, but it might succeed. You never know. Just always make sure that you do these tests on scrap clay and not something you've worked for hours on. The last thing I'm going to talk about before I move on to the baking stage is liquid clay. Now, when I was starting out in polymer clay, I'd never heard of liquid clay and it did intimidate me for a bit because I didn't really know what it was for. But it has quite a lot of uses. As I mentioned before, you can mix a drop or two of it in with old crumbly clay in order to revive it and make it softer again. But you can also use it as a thin coating for paper. For instance, on decoupage, you could use it as a glaze. It can help with image transfer and I've got a video on that. Mainly people use it as a glue between different pieces of clay and another popular use is to mix it with powders or glitters to make all sorts of effects. So for instance people mix translucent liquid clay with powder to make imitation frosting for tiny little cake charms. So there's a lot of things you can do with liquid clay that can create really cool effects. Now, I've only ever used Fimo liquid clay, which goes almost totally clear after baking. However, it is available in other colours, not just clear, but also translucent, where it lets light shine through, but isn't transparent, and also white and black. So that's another thing you can have an experiment with. If you ever hear the funny term spackle, then that is just polymer clay mixed with liquid clay, to make a kind of paste that you can use to repair cracks in finished polymer clay pieces. You obviously then bake it once you've put it into the crack and then you can sand it down and that should repair your damaged item. So that's also another useful thing that it can do. The next subject is how to prevent fingerprints from getting into your clay. It's not particularly terrible to get a fingerprint in your clay. Some people like that handmade look. And also after baking, you can always sand and polish that fingerprint out. However, sanding and polishing is time consuming. And it's also quite tricky to do if you get a fingerprint in a hard to reach area of the clay. As I said before, prevention is always the best cure. So there are a few things you can do to prevent fingerprints getting onto your clay in the first place. Now, you don't have to worry about fingerprints for a lot of the time that you're working with your clay. It's mainly the final stages just before baking, which is where you want to work on smoothing your clay out and making sure there aren't fingerprints. One of the best things to do is just not be heavy handed with your clay. Don't squeeze it hard between your fingers because that will obviously give you an imprint into your clay. Also using a firmer clay helps. You can also firm up the clay yourself by doing some leaching, as I mentioned before, or putting it in the fridge. Apart from that, you can wear latex gloves. Some people hate wearing latex gloves because they get all sweaty or maybe you're allergic to them. 
One way people get around the sweatiness is to cut the fingers off the latex gloves. And then you can just wear those and stop fingerprints transferring onto your clay. Make sure that you get gloves that fit tightly around the fingers. Make sure that there are no wrinkles in that latex. Another couple of things you could do, which you would only do in the final stages of shaping just before baking, is to spray a little bit of water onto the surface of your clay and then try and smooth out the surface with the water. Some people use baby oil or mineral oil instead, but that can be a little bit more messy. You could instead, not as well as, instead use a little bit of cornstarch, which is corn flour in the UK, and put a little bit on your fingertips. This can be washed off and it just helps prevent fingerprints transferring. And now we're on to the baking stage. Now I remember when I first baked some polymer clay, I couldn't wait to pick it up after I'd baked it, waited for it to cool down slightly just so I could pick it up and then I found that it was all bendy and I thought something had gone terribly wrong. However, if you run into this, it's probably just because it's warm and when it's warmer, it will be more flexible anyway. And also most clays don't bake fully solid. There's usually a little bit of flexibility in there still, especially if the piece of clay is thin. So don't worry if it's a bit bendy and flexible after you've baked it, that's perfectly normal. I'm just going to talk a little bit now about what you can bake on. I've mentioned before that you can bake on ceramic tile directly, as well as on ovenproof glass. These two materials are very good for baking on because they're very smooth, they heat up slowly and cool down slowly. And also they heat your clay very evenly. If you're baking on metal, I would suggest not baking directly on the metal because metal does heat up quickly and cool down quickly. And also it's usually not quite as smooth as ceramic or glass. Some people put clay on top of aluminium foil and put that in a roasting tin. And that seems to work. However, it does maybe produce a bit of a weird pattern where the clay touches the foil. My suggestion would be to put some thick cardboard at the bottom of a roasting tin and then put the clay on top of that with a sheet of paper in between. Now you might be thinking you can't put paper and cardboard in the oven. Well you can as long as you keep it away from any heating elements or any burners. Keep it well away from the heat source and you should really cover the tray as well. If you do those things, you really shouldn't worry about burning. If you're worried about putting anything in the oven, then you can just test it. Just test it, keep an eye on it, and if it doesn't set on fire, then great. <laughs> and the other thing to note is, of course, you're only working at quite low temperatures. About 110 to 130 degrees centigrade usually. So it's not that hot in terms of oven temperature. I think a lot of people stress about over baking or burning their items, but it's quite difficult to do, especially if you put a cover over your clay. You can even make a sort of tent out of aluminium foil yourself, or you can buy an aluminium foil tray and just turn that upside down and put that over your clay when it's baking. These will shield your clay from direct heat in the oven. In very basic terms, baking involves melting plastic particles that are in the clay. The longer you're heating the clay for, the more of those plastic particles that will melt. And when they melt, they bond together and that creates the strength of the clay. So really, the longer you bake your clay for, the stronger it's going to be. That's why I say instead of erring on the side of caution and baking it for less, I think you should bake it for more time, if in doubt, because underbaking is worse than overbaking. The worst that can happen with underbaking is that it's just weak and it breaks, which is obviously catastrophic. But if you overbake, the worst that can happen is that the colour maybe goes slightly darker. 
However, that's not going to happen if you put it in five minutes too long, for instance. You'd have to put it in for probably hours for it to actually go dark. So if in doubt, I personally would bake for longer just to make sure that you add the strength to your clay. Some people recommend baking for about double the recommended time on the packet of clay. And this is something you can just experiment with and test with scrap clay just to see what happens. If there's no difference to the colour of the clay, then I would definitely recommend baking for longer because that will only add to the strength of your clay. And also, some people find that if you bake clay longer, you can get a shinier finish. If you have problems with burning, which I think is actually very rare, but a lot of people worry about it, the first thing I would do is put a cover over your clay, as I've mentioned before, made out of aluminium foil. If that doesn't work, I would definitely invest in an oven thermometer because sometimes ovens aren't very accurate in terms of their temperature. So you might be putting it on 110 degrees centigrade, but it might actually fluctuate up to 130 degrees centigrade or more. So an oven thermometer will either tell you that the oven is the problem or exclude the oven from the investigation. Um, so it's definitely a good tool to get if you're having problems with burning and you don't know the cause. If you want to shape your clay when you're baking it, so you don't just want to lay it flat on a flat surface, you can rest it over shaped items. So for instance, if you want to turn a disc of clay into a kind of arch shape, you can rest it on half a tube of cardboard whilst it's baking in the oven. You could also use the bottoms of muffin or cupcake trays. You could use oven proof glass or ceramic bowls just to add a nice curve to your clay shapes. You can even rest them on smooth wooden shapes or even light bulbs if they don't have plastic in them. If the shape you're using isn't non-stick or it's not particularly smooth, for instance, a cardboard tube, then just cover the tube with paper first before you put the clay onto it. The paper can be normal paper, but I would probably suggest using baking or parchment paper instead just to make the clay a little bit easier to remove. One great thing about polymer clay is that it doesn't shrink. So anything you stick into the surface of the clay, for instance beads or wire, will not fall out during baking as the clay shrinks. You can also part bake polymer clay. So for instance, if you're working on an item that involves many different elements, especially elements that are layered on top of each other, once you've done one layer and you're happy with how it looks, you can then part bake it to kind of set it in place to make sure that when you continue working and adding more elements to it, you don't distort or ruin what you've already done. This is great for more complex pieces of work. So to part bake, all you have to do is bake it for a part of the recommended baking time. So maybe around half the recommended time. You can then add more clay, then part bake again, then add more clay and part bake again. And then as a last stage, you'll bake it for the full recommended time. Just don't worry about baking and rebaking clay. That is totally fine and it's not going to damage your clay. One last thing is about safety and you shouldn't be baking foodstuffs at the same time as you bake clay because there's some small fumes involved that aren't going to be great to get into your food. As well as that, don't mix items used for food with items used for clay. If after baking you want to remove any dust or fibres that are just on the surface of the clay, you can do this by using nail polish remover i.e. acetone. You just dip a cotton bud into some acetone and then just rub it over the surface of the clay where the dust or fibres are and this should remove it. And that concludes my video all about getting started with polymer clay. I know it's been a long one so thank you very much for sticking with me and I hope you've learned some things along the way. Thank you very much for watching.